Welcome to the Sustainable Dish Podcast. I'm Diana Rogers, a real food registered dietitian, author, and sustainability advocate. I co-host this podcast with James Connolly, who was a producer on my film, Sacred Cow. I also founded the Global Food Justice Alliance, an initiative advocating for the inclusion of animal source foods like meat, dairy, and eggs for a more nutritious, sustainable, and equitable worldwide food system. You can check it out and join me at globalfoodjustice.org. Thanks again for listening, and now on to our show. Uh, okay, uh, so this is uh, James Connolly for Sustainable Dish uh, podcast. Um, uh, I, I, this is a sort of real honor. Um, there's, I, I read a lot of a lot of books, um, and you know, one of the things I actually really, really enjoy is when when I, I sit down and I read a book, um, and somebody, uh, the writer, kind of understands the poetry of writing. Um, there, there are so many blurbs that I actually just cut and pasted and, and posted to my Twitter. Uh, they were perfect encapsulations of of the way that I try to think about. Um, you know, uh, moving into, uh, you know, a future that is, that is in, in a line with, with nature and with our planet and, and, and building a, a sort of a utopia um, built on, uh, you know, hearkening back to the, to, to the past uh, in a way that actually builds biodiversity and builds a movement and a culture that, that is centered around all of this stuff. And one of the things I kept on thinking about when I was reading the book um, let me introduce the book right now. It's called Hoof Prints on the Land, How Traditional Herding and Grazing Can Restore the Soil and Bring Animal Agriculture Back in Balance with the Earth. Um, and um, one of the things I was thinking about with this uh, was a story from uh, Daniel Quinn, um, who was talking about um, the, uh, the book of Genesis uh, and sort of Cain and Abel. Um, and he said, if you actually look at it from an agricultural lens, um, you have those sort of um, Cain is is the sedentary farmer, uh, and Abel is the pastoralist. Um, and God actually accepts Abel's uh, sacrifice and rejects Cain's. Um, he tries to give it from the perspective of what was happening during that time as pastoralist communities were actually bumping up against uh, sedentary agricultural communities, uh, and the the amount of blood that was spilled between the two. Um, and a lot of sed when you think about sedentary agricultural communities from a historical perspective, they're very dominated by hierarchical structures. They're very dominated by control, um, and pastoralists like are kind of hard to control. <laughs> right? Um, they move a lot, um, and so this this book actually kind of really gives you a, a, an understanding of this. Um, and so I want to uh, introduce um, Ilse Kohler Wolfson. Uh, and thank you so much for coming on. Uh, this book is so wonderful. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so, excited. yeah. So this is, I mean, this is a culmination of like a career working in veterinary science. Uh, this is a culmination of an attitude of really wanting to understand the deep knowledge uh, within pastoralist communities. But I, I kind of want to get into the sense of how you ended up in the space. Um, uh, well, basically, I'm an animal person. I love, I've love, i loved animals from when I was a child. I grew up with animals, and then the natural choice for a profession was to become a veterinary doctor. Uh, and I went through my veterinary studies, and then I started to practice, and I found out I didn't, it didn't really agree with me because I couldn't, I was not suited to be a small animal person because it involves a lot of owner psychology, and you have to do, you know, to please the owner. Most of, many of the pets don't really have that much wrong with them. And um, I liked large animal farm animal practice because I love talking to the farmers, but I didn't like the work that was associated with it. Uh, mostly it involved uh, doing artificial insemination on cows and uh, already, you know, this trend towards uh, more industrial lives of keeping was, you know, it was showing up and it was, uh, I didn't like that every decision was based on economics. Uh, you know, it had to make, it, it's understandable for a farmer, of course, a farmer uh, has to ma you know, make a living and, and can't be too sentimental, but uh, I don't know. I just 
didn't feel really comfortable. And then what, what really killed everything off my uh, identification with a veterinary profession was that I went to um, Kentucky on a horse uh, breeding, a very famous horse breeding farm to, saw back, to see practice there because I, I loved thoroughbred horses. They're so beautiful and elegant mm -hmm. and everything. And then I found out this is all, this is hyper commercial. And uh, it was just about money and these poor, uh, you know, horses, like two year old horses, they were raised on painkillers. And at the end of their first season, they're finished off. So I, mm -hmm. I thought, no. Uh, this is not what I want to do. And um, I don't know, I, I came across archaeology. And uh, fortunately, I had a skill that was useful uh, for archaeologists. I had that uh, anatomical knowledge from my veterinary studies, I could identify the animal bones that they dig up on archaeological site and large mm. thousands of them, basically. And if you identify them by species and by body part and so on, uh, you can actually make conclusions about uh, past ecologies and also past economies, uh, what people were eating, how they were using the animals. And you can uh, trace changes in the relationship with the environment uh, over time. And uh, so I had the good fortune. I got accepted as a volunteer on an uh, archaeological expedition in Jordan, a lovely site called Pella in the Jordan Valley which was occupied from the Stone Age until uh, basically the present time. So mm -hmm. um, it was just, uh, so it was interesting from the bone part, uh, from that perspective. Uh, it was interesting also from the fact that archeologists have a holistic approach. You know, they try to reconstruct former civilizations and cultures. And from all perspective, you know, you need a lot of different disciplines that, that are involved in order to do these reconstructions and interpretations. You have geologists, botanists, zoologists, uh, human osteologists and uh, stratigraphers and um, palynologists and, and, and so on. So it was a multidisciplinary team working together. So I loved that work, but I even more, I, I fell in love with a, a Bedouin camel herd that was passing by our site every day. Mm. It was a beautiful scene of that camel herd is singing to uh, his herd and, and that, uh, and how this, you know, a huge herd of camels, about hundred or so, they were so obedient. You know, he gave them a voice command and they all stopped in their tracks or they started drinking or they did do this. And so I was just uh, totally taken by that. Uh, I fell in love with camels and, <laughs> and I did research on them. So at first it was just emotional. Uh, and then I, uh, I started reading about camels, how useful they are for uh, people who live in arid parts of the world and um, how wonderful their, their products are and, and, and all these things. So um, I just got into uh, camel research, did my PhD on camel domestication and uh, and, yeah, and after having worked for 10 years with just bones of dead animals, I felt it's time now to do some, you know, work with living camels. And uh, so <laughs> it, it went and I ended up in India because at that time, India still had a huge camel population. I had a fellowship uh, from the American Institute of Indian Studies and um, it was very difficult to, to start working there. It took me months to, uh, actually meet any camel nomads because you know they're here one day gone the next day right. uh, I didn't know the language at that time so it was it was just a lot of trouble and then finally I was um, I was fortunate and I met the first veterinarian from the Raika community mm. and he talked to me about his his caste and uh, uh, how they were made by God Shiva to take care of camels and uh, he introduced me to uh, a village where they were Raika um, having a lot of camels. And then I don't know, one step led to another. I, uh, um, yeah, I just, it was all emotional. Uh, but then afterwards I found a lot of rationale to actually do <laughs> what mm -hmm. I felt like doing. And, and uh, I was so impressed by this culture of, uh, of intimacy between people and animals and uh, the, the people being members of the household and members of the family and um, how the fate of the animals and the people were kind of interlinked and um, 
and already at that time, this was early 1991 actually, uh, mm. already it was evident that this culture was under a lot of pressure and um, because they were being excluded from their traditional grazing areas, the camels were undernourished as a consequence that made them predisposed to becoming sick. So uh, they wanted veterinary support from me. And uh, mm -hmm. yeah, so I ended up in that way <laughs> by accident. <laughs> uh, um, so I, I, there's so many different directions we can go right now, um, but I, I do think it's a it, it's it's interesting um, that how timely this book is because I think we what we are seeing um, is the end results or even uh, you know in some ways my fear is the mid result of uh, a, a huge push a global push for uh, uh, dedicated and protected conservation areas. Um, and if you're studying the Maasai, uh, especially in Kenya and Tanzania, we already are seeing the end result of that. They've already been, um, there are a number of different uh, protests that ended in violence uh, over the past year and a half, uh, specifically against the Maasai. But this is also a 30 year campaign where uh, they've essentially been in enclosed within these spaces that don't allow for uh, a greater free range of movement. Uh, and we see this happening glo globally with uh, reindeer herders. We see it happening with the Maasai, and we also see it happening in different uh, sections uh, in Eastern Europe. And I just wonder if you want to kind of give sort of a, um, an, an overall sort of comparison to what you think is actually happening. Because if, if the animals are getting sick, it's the result of poor nutrition because of governmental policies. Do you agree or? Exactly, I, I totally agree. It's a result of uh, government, um, basically also of the lack of government policies of governments uh, not being able to uh, understand or realize or, or see uh, the enormous economic importance that their the pastoralist communities actually have in their respective countries. And this is all based, uh, it, it, it goes back to how uh, you know the people who are in charge of policy making for uh, animal husbandry or so they are all trained in the Western model. Uh, so they they went to study in the U.S. or in Europe, and uh, they're they're infused with this uh, what I call the efficiency paradigm, which base, which looks at uh, animals in from a very narrow perspective. Uh, they I mean natural what they call natural resource efficiency that is kind of the mantra of the discipline and it just looks at basically how much feed you put into the animal and then how much product you get out and uh, all the other um, repercussions on the environment and so on of that approach are being totally ignored and also uh, a lot of things are totally misrepresented unfortunately um, if you look at it, uh, at pastoralism, they are actually the most efficient protein producers that, that we have because they use uh, very fibrous cellulose rich forage. And it's not grass, actually. You know, we always in the West or in the North, we always talk about <laughs> grass, uh, yeah. but it's actually <laughs> shrubs and trees and thistles right. and weeds. And so what, what, uh, what the livestock is eating. Uh, very rarely grass. I mean, gra grass is only in a few countries. So. <laughs> and so they they uh, basically they convert this waste into highly nutritious food. I mean, uh, um, mostly milk and but also meat, and very importantly also the manure, which uh, keeps the act the crop cultivation growing. Uh, so there are actually FAO data showing that in countries uh, which have big pastoralist populations like Ethiopia and Kenya. There, um, the animals produce like 10 times more protein than they are being fed. Whereas mm -hmm. in the US, it, it's exactly the opposite. I think the animals are you know, fed with uh, two times as much protein as you actually um, get out of them. So it's a totally, this feedlotting, feeding animals with uh, crops that have been grown elsewhere uh, with, uh, you know, with fertilizers and uh, pesticides and I don't know what, bringing them to the animals, uh, it's actually, it's a totally destructive process of, uh, for, for protein. It's, um, 
it is nonsensical at all. But from the animal science perspective, it's the most efficient because they just measure, uh, you know, the amount of meat that comes out at the end. And they don't, they also, they don't even look at the, uh, uh, the composition of the meat. The, the, uh, composition of the meat from animals in, in feedlots is totally different from that that I have been raised on pasture. So, mm -hmm. uh, so it's a very simplistic uh, view that animal scientists have been um, have adopted, and through that they have actually they have kind of maybe not even willingly or knowingly connived with all these industrial livestock production systems that are. Uh, the cause of, of the ire of a lot of the people who go vegan, uh, vegan or vegetarian. Um, I mean, that's that's one reason I think, you know, why um, people are so much against livestock because they see the cruelty that's uh, involved frequently. Uh, mm -hmm. The other reasons, of course, I think, as you know, I've, I've just heard you write it somewhere or say it somewhere that uh, there are massive commercial interests be behind artificial meat and dairy and uh, so it's uh, those players that want to that just focus on the climate uh, negative climate effects and so on yeah and I, you know i think for us it's um i uh, people who have actually been involved in this argument for a long time uh the when the conversation became the single-minded conversation about uh emissions uh, specifically carbon and methane emissions um one of the things that we said was that how nimble the industrial agricultural uh, system was that they would in essence just create methane digesters right and yes. so they would say their, their answer to everything is to consolidate more and more and so they'll put more animals into a more confined yes. confined space exactly. because they say well, we, now we have to deal with this one single element. <laughs> exactly. And we can, I mean, yes. <laughs> yeah, just narrowing everything. I mean, and they, they right. forget at the side, okay, they might, might have less methane uh, per, uh, per unit of, of uh, livestock product. But what about uh, the biodiversity loss? And, and what about the pollution and all these other, the antibiotic resistance and all these um, yeah. other aspects are being totally ignored. The, if you talk livestock sustainability in the animal science circus, circles, it is just about climate, 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 uh, nothing else. Yeah, um, and I, I do think like when when we look at uh, the um, some of the some of the things I actually marvel at sometimes are the efficiencies that kind of happen within industrialized livestock. Um, you know, the you you kind of talk about it. it in in the book about bringing animals back onto the land after harm har harvest uh after mm -hmm. agricultural harvest uh to eat a lot of the roughage and the agricultural byproducts that are left on the land um and then the manure uh and the urine is then used to to bring back fertility to that land um exactly. part of part of the after effects of the green revolution was that um, india's land wasn't actually suitable for the, the the level of um, uh, industrial fertilizers and and all of the uh, pesticides and agricultural like insecticides that were there that mm -hmm. are put onto that land, it really exhausts the land very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think um, one of the things that I kind of find interesting about that is that like in the industrial side, they will say, well, we take distillers grains, we take agricultural byproducts, we take all of this stuff, and then we feed it to ruminant animals specifically. Mm -hmm. um, and the efficiency of that is um, is one of the problems that I, I, I worry about, because when we're always looking to efficiency, the thing that is constantly like <laughs> thrown out is mm -hmm. the morality of the situation. Like what is, what is a moral world that we wanna live in? And we're we're so focused on this one thing, sustainability and efficiency, that these guys have, in essence, kind of co-opted the conversation and are just taking all of this stuff and then just moving into these single metrics uh, mm -hmm. to say that they're sustainable. And we're finding this in the fossil fuel industry. We're finding this everywhere. Um, I don't know if there's a question in that, but I, I do think that there's an interesting aspect of the degree one of the things that you kind of talk about is the degree of knowledge that is among pastoralist communities that can't be quantified, right? Yes. 
Uh, mm -hmm. The way that they think about sustainability is so different from the way that we think about it that we almost don't even have a language for the way that they talk about it. So I wonder if you can kind of elucidate on that. No, it's it's you you're absolutely right. So they they take the holistic view. They they take so many factors uh, into consideration. If you look at animal science, you know you have specialists in in each little discipline in nutrition and genetics and uh, mm -hmm. uh, pharmacology and I don't know what and and pastors have a they have a holistic view. They consider all these things. They can exactly um, uh, see the relationship between the. Uh, um, the animals and and the vegetation and they know when it's time to move or actually they listen to the animals that's the thing I mean uh, so in in animal science the animal is an object uh, you know it's it's just composed of metrics and here the animal is a living being which you uh, trust or with which you have a relationship you listen you know to what they say and you try to uh, make their life easy uh, so, so it's 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 a continuous dialogue between animals and and people. That's for one thing. So, and they're very uh, pastors. Also, they they have great powers of observation. They can um, they know each of the animals very well. They their different behaviors. So they they treat each animal as an individual, and um, it's. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it bears no relationship to the uh, to animal science, and and that's why I why I like it so much because the animals are taken as a they're on the same level. It's not like human dominating the the animal. And um, so this is actually the the overarching problem is this, you know, of the technocrats believing we can change the world uh, as we like or as we want and. Uh, the the indigenous view or the passive view is we are part of uh, we are we are part of something bigger and we need to align ourselves with it we need we are part of nature and we have to adapt to nature we have to humor nature and um nature sometimes is is cool uh, it's uh, it's terrible but then if uh, you know if you adapt to it then after some time nature can also be bountiful so you you arrange yourself with nature rather than trying to dominate it. And, and, and this is what we have to learn. <laughs> mm -hmm. Relearn, yeah. I think. Yeah. And, you know, I do think that there's a lot of scientists who are trying to reevaluate uh, Darwinian evolution from the perspective uh, that there was there is a hierarchy between predator and prey and all of the stuff that sort of happens that 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 nature is red in tooth and claw <laughs> you know because i think it's so much more cooperative than than we've ever given it credit for and i think uh, the way that we studied evolution the way we studied uh you know civilization uh is was always through the lens of people who were uh you know, educated within uh, these sort of realms of aristocracy and hierarchy. Um, and, you know, you kind of talk about in there sort of uh, Wolves' relationship to pastoralists uh, and how they they view um, Wolves as integral to, uh, in some ways, sort of uh, the management of, of sheep and, uh, you know, other animals. I wonder if you can kind of talk a little bit about that. Uh, yeah, that that's also, I mean, what I see is, uh, this totally relaxed view uh, if animals are taken by a predator, um, whether it's uh, wolves or whether it's, I mean, in my area, it's mostly leopards that um, mm -hmm. prey on livestock and it's it happens regularly. And uh, if it's within certain limits, it, uh, it's totally accepted and they, they say, oh, the leopard also has to eat. No. Uh, mm -hmm. And wolves, yes, uh, with wolves also, so there's a... a uh, in central India on the Deccan Plateau, there are uh, pastoral cultures, there are the Kuruba and the Danga, and in that area, uh, wolves are quite frequent, and the, they actually worship uh, the wolf, and because mm -hmm. they, they think the wolves keep the herds healthy by eliminating um, sick animals, and they actually, uh, some people I talked to, they were worried because the wolf had disappeared. Uh, they, mm -hmm. <laughs> they need the wolf. Of course, you know, that's it's a nice idealized uh, situation but we also have to see i mean in like in germany we've had massive reintroduction of wolves and uh 
uh, people are not used to it, a shepherd. So uh, the wolves can also cause a lot of uh, uh, trouble. So, I mean, you need, uh, we need to balance it out in a way. Uh, there are mm -hmm. some wolves who, uh, who are killers. I mean, who just go into a flock and kill lots of sheep. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, that's also not uh, acceptable, I find. <laughs> so, um, but the thing is, I think here also people have uh, forgotten, maybe earlier they had skills uh, how to deal with wolves. Yeah? So for, for a century or so, there haven't been any wolves. So I think the knowledge of how to deal with wolves is, is mm -hmm. not there. Uh, even, uh, I mean, recently in India, um, so uh, one in, uh, in that area where I live, there is talk about reintroducing tigers. Uh, uh, and mm -hmm. uh, that has us actually up in arms because uh, tigers are really, uh, I mean, they, they kill people too. Leopards, they don't. Or wolves also, they don't. But, but mm -hmm. tigers uh, kill a lot of people. So we are definitely not keen having the tigers reintroduced into our area because actually tigers are also, um, they are not, I mean, they're less threatened than the wolf in uh, in India. Uh, wolves, are, mm -hmm. there are less wolves in India than than than, than tigers, but tigers is, is kind of the national uh, emblem also. Right. Um, but so, in, so we are, personally, we are very scared of the uh, tiger being reintroduced, but we went to visit uh, Another pastors group in the Himalayas, the Van Gujars, who have buffaloes, uh, they and they have also a uniquely intimate relationship with their buffaloes, and they walk up and down the Himalayas. And in the summer, mm. they go really high in the, the alpine pastures, and they were saying they have no problem uh, coexisting with tigers, mm. which I, uh, I was really surprised of, about. Yeah. You want you might want to fact check me on this, but I think there's more tigers in Texas than there is anywhere else in the world. Oh, I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, Texans like decide they want to get tigers, and then no, they, you come know, on, no, no. Uh, Are you talking about this? Is tigers? America? Yeah, like real tigers. Yeah. No, no, <laughs> they're not native. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes they get out. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, you know, I think that um, one of the things that I've been thinking about and, and was thinking about a lot when I was reading your book was um, the, uh, so the last time we had a climate crisis was at the, at the turn of the century, and it was centered around um, uh, bringing nutrition back to the soil. Um, they had gone into the Atacama Desert and were trying to get as much bat and bird guano as possible, um, and, but prior to the Haber-Bosch method being invented in Germany in 1906, mm -hmm. uh, the, the world was running out of, of nitrogen. Um, mm -hmm. And it created a real crisis. There was a, a, a lot of the colonial land grab uh, that happened in the scramble for Africa. A, a lot of the, the movement towards more colonization was to build new farm land and new farm spaces. Um, and so I, I'm trying to build a parallel between a lot of the stuff that happened in the early 20th century, um, especially in the States. Uh, you know, you had, uh, you had guys um, who were the sort of original anthropologists like Madison Grant, uh, who was highly racist, um, but was also involved in the saving of the, of the bison, the American bison. Oh, really? Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And he created some of the first zoos. He created some of the, and he was the one uh, along with another a, a number of different scientists who uh, convinced Teddy Roosevelt to, to create the national park system. Mm -hmm. um, and so when the national park system was created, uh, you know, they kicked off indigenous people who had been living there for, you know, hundreds and thousands of years. Uh, and so the, the methodology at the time and the thinking at the time uh, was to rewild these landscapes and to bring uh, to sort of uh, excise people from them so that the, 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 you know, you could hold on to these pristine landscapes. Um, totally racist, totally without any knowledge of how, um, you know, uh, a lot of herding communities and in indigenous peoples were stewards of the land. They farmed in a very different way. Uh, they farmed communally. Um, and so I, I'm wondering if you like you see a lot of parallels because I, I see you talk about this a lot within the landscape of the 30 by 30, which is 30 percent of the world uh, being, uh, you know, sort of fortress colonialism, kicking off yeah. indigenous peoples. 
Uh, and then also the closing of the commons that's happening within many pastoralist communities that are happening. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I wonder if you want to talk a little bit about uh, that. Yes, uh, fortress conservation. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's 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 very concerning, and uh, this uh, yes, I mean it's a big issue at the ongoing uh, COP uh, of the CBD fifteen there that. Um, this 30 by 30, that 30% 30 of the land mass, land mass and ocean should be uh, conserved or, or pre mm -hmm. kept pristine. I'm, I'm actually not exactly sure what they mean by that. By uh, yeah, uh, It's not totally clear to me, but uh, actually, I mean, these places, the 30% are, a, I mean, they're, they're totally, you know, differently distributed. There are some countries who have a lot of them and other countries who don't. And so mm -hmm. I, so I think there's no clarity at the moment also how this would be implemented. But one thing is for sure, those places which still represent uh, nature or they seem like uh, nature, they are like that because they have been managed by indigenous peoples <laughs> and by, by uh, among whom pastors are a big uh, proportion. Uh, so, uh, I mean, I would be okay with 30% with 30 by 30, if the management was actually given to the pastors and to the indigenous peoples, if it was handed over to them. Uh, I don't know if that's practical, but uh, I mean, basically it's prevention. We have to prevent um, commercial interests coming in and exploiting and mining and I don't know, uh, destroying mm -hmm. the landscapes. Uh, so I know that would be controversial too, uh, you know, because some indigenous uh, members of indigenous peoples also they want they want development. Um, so it's a very tricky situation. Um, how to handle yeah. this? Yeah, I mean, I do feel like some part of it's a false promise, right? Um, oh, you it's, know. A, it's a false promise because yes, mm -hmm. if it is implemented as as uh, governments or so envision it, it will be fortress conservation exactly. Right. Yeah. And uh, yeah. Do you often suffer from headaches, muscle cramps, fatigue, or sleeplessness? It could be from an electrolyte deficiency. Drinking plain water may not be enough to replenish lost electrolytes, which is especially important for athletes, kids, breastfeeding moms, those who are on a low-carb diet, and it can help regulate appetite. Element was created by my co-author and good friend, Rob Wolf, and is free of artificial ingredients, food coloring, gluten, fillers, and sugar. To put it simply, Element is a drink mix that has everything you need and nothing you don't. Even U.S. Olympic athletes rely on Element, and I personally recommend it to everyone in my nutrition practice. I love the raspberry and citrus flavors, and when you buy via my link, You'll get a free sample pack of a variety of flavors for you to try. Plus, they have a convenient subscription program that makes it easy for you to keep your favorite flavors fully supplied. Head over to SustainableDish.com backslash L-M-N-T to give it a try. That's SustainableDish.com backslash L-M-N-T. And, you know, I, I interviewed somebody recently who was talking about the um, insect crisis, uh, yes. specifically in places like, let's say, Denmark, but anywhere it's studied, mm -hmm. we're finding, yeah. um, even even within places that have been protected areas for, you know, for 50 years, um, El UK uh, Park in Puerto Rico have found massive declines in, in insects. And so the trophic cascade that happens when insects are gone are is just like I don't even think we can comprehend it. It was one of the scariest books yeah. I've read in a really long time. Um, but the the idea that you can create this conservation area um, that would then uh, create these safe harbors for insects it just isn't true. Um, you can't build these bubbles uh, yeah. on the planet and then continue to do everything else that you're doing in the West and in the global North, um, you know, uh, forever. Um, and I think exactly. that's one of the biggest pushbacks that, uh, that mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, Survival International and Amnesty International, um, you know, they were, they were just talking about this uh, literally at the beginning of the month. Um, if, I, if I may, I just want to read a passage uh, yeah. to get your, 
here. Um, so this is Fior Fiori Longo, who is Survival's decolonized, decolonized conservation campaign. And she said, the idea that 30 by 30 is an effective means of protecting biodiversity has no basis in science. The only reason it's still being discussed in the negotiations is because it's being pushed hard by the conservation industry, which sees an opportunity to double the amount of land under its control. Should it go ahead, it will constitute the biggest land grab in history and rob millions of people of their livelihoods. If governments are really meaningful about protecting biodiversity, the, the answer is simple, recognize the, light, the rights of indigenous peoples. Absolutely, I totally agree, yeah. I totally agree. And I mean, um, coming back to the, uh, the insect crisis, I mean, we need, uh, so for, for insects uh, to thrive also, we need animal, you know, larger animals in the landscape. We need I mean, yeah. the manure you know, from livestock is a, it's a hotbed for insect uh, creation and development. So uh, in fact, I think, where did I read it recently that, uh, I mean, it's a disappearance from uh, animals from the landscape, from livestock from the landscape that, that has uh, majorly contributed to the insect crisis. So, um, and there are also some people saying that, uh, so, I mean, in nature, we have that relationship, you know, we have uh, the plants which uh, synthesize the, the energy um, uh, by means of photosynthesis and then uh, animals, they can't do that. So they have to move around to uh, capture that energy. And uh, uh, then after some time they die and everything. So they said, there's that cycle. I mean, where mm -hmm. plants are sedentary and animals move and we need them both together in the landscape. I mean, we can't just have, this is a huge problem with this agriculture is that it's also split into um, plant expert and in, into crop people and into livestock experts and they don't talk to each other and they don't see that they really they that they need to interact we need to create agro ecosystems where um, animals and plants are uh, are together mm -hmm. and um coming back yeah and some people actually there's i've heard some scientists say that we do not have because we have had such a loss of wild megafauna um, and the wild megafauna is really important and that in to fill in for that actually we need livestock at least for the time being we have to have mm -hmm. animal uh, livestock in the landscape because there are no other options and i can uh, confirm that also from india the, those uh, leopards i was talking about their main diet is sheep and goat uh, mm -hmm. Yet the sheep and goat pastures are not allowed to go into the forest where those lepers are being conserved. Uh, it just doesn't make any sense at all. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It, I mean, it's very con and concerning because I do find, um, you know, the the food summit, the UN food summit, uh, yeah, the that was another the, thing. Yeah. The yeah. level of protest from indigenous people who actually boycotted that. Um, yeah, yeah. They, they said mm -hmm. we we've been. The, the the this the plenary uh, sessions were all governed by Nestle and Unilever and these mul large multinational corporations yeah. um, who have had you know a hundred years to convince us this is the only way that humans can learn how to eat <laughs> or feed themselves yeah. uh -huh. um, um, and but, so they yeah yeah go ahead please. but no but you know at the at the uh, UN food system there was also I was involved in one. Um, a process or so it was uh, on rangelands and pastoralism and mm -hmm. we had a few events uh have you heard of the international year of rangelands and pastoralism pastoralists that's coming up in 2026 it's mm -hmm. going to be it's an a un year and it's uh, it was uh, spearheaded by the government of mongolia and there's a oh, huge wow. um, a huge movement in mongolia is one of the few countries <laughs> That, the, that takes pride in its uh, pastoralist heritage because there yeah. never were any farmers, basically. Uh, but so, uh, but there's a huge um, civil society movement behind it. Also, they have a website, um, uh, iyrp.org, and uh, very active. So I, uh, we all have our hopes that something will happen in that year of International mm -hmm. Year of Rancher and Pastoralist. So they, that was a good a part of that uh, uh, food system summit i mean we we had some events and we were quite pleased but uh, there's also the livestock people also had um, 
events and they were really upset because um, mm -hmm. um, there were a lot of these representatives of the in industrial um, uh, livestock sector, the International Meat Secretary, the International Dairy Federation and so on. And uh, they were trying to project themselves as being sustainable and uh, mm -hmm. uh, net zero and, uh, and all that. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, so it was going along like that. And then the, the Secretariat of the uh, Food System Summit, they put in place uh, a new chair or so, um, Philip Limbery from the, uh, he's from the Compassion and World Animal Farming. And uh, he didn't want to have any of that. <laughs> so finally, <laughs> so that process stopped actually. Oh, right, right, yeah. right. Yeah, you talked about that, yeah. Um... Yeah, I mean, I, I just think it's um, uh, it's just such a narrow worldview that we're, we're yeah. being shuttled into, um, you know, and I, I do think when when you're in this moment where you feel uh, where there is a crisis going on, um, the, you know, the the story that we tell us ourselves about what the future looks like, um, you know, is it's just so important. Um, and, you know, I I. Uh, there's there's so many sort of great stories on in in your book about uh, pastoralist communities who some some have been forced to go into the city uh, to work uh, children who've been forced to go into the city and to just realize how much was lost uh, mm -hmm. by moving into that monoculture <laughs> which is cities are <laughs> like this is a livestock for humans <laughs> um, and so it's just so interesting that the level of disconnection that happens, the level of like, you know, that, that you, you're you losing so much of humanity when you move away from that space. Uh, and so many of them come back um, and realize that it was, it was a false bargain. Um, well, and so there's so many really wonderful stories in that. Mm. You know, you hope, you hope that everybody realizes that. <laughs> yeah, you, you know, I mean, I don't know. I do have hope that, uh, maybe there will be some positive uh, developments. I, I I think because, I mean, th those people who support, uh, the, I mean, this pastoralist rangeland people, they're becoming strong. I mean, they're developing a lot of momentum. Mm. And I also feel that the industrial livestock sector, it will collapse um, at some stage or the other because of the antibiotic resistance about, you know, another pandemic, livestock pandemic coming up or so. Already, mm. uh, I mean, they, they, they face so many problems with uh, uh, mass cullings of chickens and, uh, you know, it, I mean, it, it just is not a sustainable system. It might just collapse uh, on its own. And uh, as you probably, as you know, a lot of those uh, corporates that are in the livestock sector, they're also uh, now going into the artificial meat and dairy and, and, and so on. Mm -hmm. I think they are hedging their bets. Uh, so my prediction is it, the industrial livestock production will come to an end at, at some mm -hmm. stage. So. Yeah, I mean, my, my fear is, and, and I'm sure that this is a sort of bottom line budgetary reason to move into it. If you could somehow convince people to eat livestock feed and that was <laughs> like, then you cut out the the animal as the middleman, and you could charge the same premium for it. So I think it was a fiscal response and economic response uh, to that. And and JBS has moved away from it. A lot of the ones that were heavy investors, the plant based meats, I think, have actually moved away from uh, funding that. Um, but yeah, I, oh, uh, really? yeah, uh -huh. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, one of the things you kind of talk about is the sort of uh, the lack of resiliency within the the industrial livestock sector. Yeah, that, I wonder if you want to kind of go thing. into that. Yeah, yeah exactly. Genetic I mean, resiliency almost, and uh -huh. go ahead. I mean, the value chains also now. I mean, that wasn't that ha what happened during the lockdown that, or you know, these animals couldn't be uh, processed. Uh, they couldn't mm -hmm. be slaughtered anymore because they'd become too big uh, to fit into the um, into the, mm. that. Uh, that chain and and so on, on the, to fit on the conveyor belts or so on. Um, yes, so uh, yeah, genetic resilience that's really important uh, actually. So uh, pastoralists, not just pastoralists, but also on other indigenous livestock keepers, they have developed over since domestication over the last um, eight, nine, ten thousand years. They, so they have developed this wide diversity of 
breeds that are adapted to their specific ecosystems and to their specific utilization patterns. So, so they have actually increased biodiversity mm -hmm. uh, through, through their uh, traditional knowledge and uh, through managing people in different environments. And, uh, and these animals are really, I mean, they are the backbone. That, this is what we need for uh, uh, facing uh, climate change, uh, uh, mm -hmm. rising temperatures. I mean, that, that, these really drought adapted hardy livestock, they are uh, one of the biggest assets we have. But what has happened is that again, because of that efficiency paradigm, <laughs> only mm -hmm. these uh, you know high, very high yielding uh, breeds have been promoted by governments and 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 so on. And so we've had this amazing narrowing uh, of the gene pool going on. Uh, these uh, like the Holstein Friesian cows. I mean, they have there's no they all descend from, I think only two bulls. Uh, like it's it's totally amazing. So that's another indication of how vulnerable these systems are, these these industrial systems. So we we need in order to be able to um, face the future and adapt to global change. We des desperately we need that uh, domestic animal diversity that's been uh, created by by pastors. But in order to do that, we we cannot conserve them or maintain them if we don't have people who actually have access to comments and, and to land, and we can't conserve them uh, by deep freezing them or so, because that mm -hmm. uh, keeps them stagnant. I mean, then they are frozen. They don't, they don't uh, evolve any further. They, don't, they can't adapt to new diseases. It's, it's a total, um, totally wrong thinking that uh, we can conserve that diversity by deep freezing it. Um, mm -hmm. Exito. So uh, this is we for a long time. My organization we actually focused on that, on getting recognition for the role of pastors in uh, as stewards of that genetic diversity, and mm -hmm. uh, we were uh, very involved at that level. But uh, at that time we, <laughs> we weren't really heard, uh, or we didn't make any impact. Yeah. So yeah, you talk the you talk about the Wadubi uh, cattle. Uh, that are resilient to so much um, drought they, and, you know. There, yeah, there are many. And, and I mean, it, it's again, also they're adapted often to specific types of vegetation. And, yeah. and that's one thing, but this adaptation is not only genetic, it's also learned. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, young animals learn from their mothers, their feeding behavior and, and their behavior altogether. So uh, if, if that, transmission of no, of animal knowledge from one generation to the next is um, interrupted, then uh, you're, you're lost. Um, the genetics as such are not going to help you. You need uh, the learned knowledge as well. Uh, and I mentioned, I think also in the book, there's this um, word called hefted, uh, which comes from Britain, where uh, sheep are hefted to certain uh, grazing common grazing areas and they don't step out of them even if there's no fence because they've learned mm. uh, this from their mothers and when uh, foot and mouth disease came uh, a lot of these uh, flocks had to be culled and then it's very difficult to uh, uh, get these systems back in place and i think actually these systems were exempted from culling to some extent because it, that mm. importance was realized yeah I wonder if you could talk about um, the um, Spanish, the Canadas, and the um, Canadas. Yes. Canadas. Can um, I think Canadas. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. Um, yes, Four so, years of high school Spanish, and, and none oh. of it stuck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yes, yeah, so Spain. Spain actually has a long history of um, a sheep rearing and. Uh, Spain is the source of the Merino sheep, uh, which has this really fine wool. And actually the Merino sheep, it probably, it, it also, the, the ancestors of the Merino sheep actually came from Arabia. I think it was Arabian mm -hmm. um, who, who created um, most of that breed. But anyway, so this Merino sheep had this really fine wool, which was very much in demand globally. So they, for one thing, they tried to have a monopoly and it was not allowed to export uh, any Merino sheep from Spain for uh, several hundreds of years. And I think there was the death penalty if you took a, a Merino sheep mm. out of the country. 
but because they also realized uh, you know, for the wool quality, it was important that the sheep were in good health. And for being in good health, they needed to move from summer to winter pastures. Um, and so the, the Spanish crown actually instituted this network of yeah, what are called cañadas for the sheep uh, to move uh, between their different seasonal pastures. And it's about like, um, I think 1% of Spain or so is covered by this network of um, uh, drove roads. <clears throat> And what happened was when the, uh, at the beginning of the 20th century, when uh, the trains uh, were put into place, people started to put the sheep on the train <laughs> to move <laughs> them from uh, winter to okay. summer pastures. Right. And that um, actually had uh, negative ecological effects because it meant that the sheep were staying in one place longer than they did earlier. And, uh, by staying there longer, they actually prevented um, regrowth of certain saplings of trees. And uh, it was a Spanish, um, a very now very famous Spanish uh, naturalist, Jesus Gasson, who, uh, who actually found out, who realized uh, what the problem was and, and then put a lot of effort into uh, getting shepherds again to to move on foot uh, with their sheep and so we've seen an amazing revival of um, uh, sheep migration in Spain and an amazing revival also of um, uh, bird of a lot of uh, fauna mm -hmm. that had disappeared and a lot of plants as, as well have, have come back now and uh, so this is a model actually for the for the rest of uh, the world <laughs> right. so in, in Spain and, and they, they actually mm -hmm. he actually managed to get the the earlier laws reinstated which gave the sheep flocks the right to walk through central Madrid for instance mm -hmm. on their migration and so now this is a big annual event where you know lots of thousands of sheep they go through the streets of Madrid and it's a big uh, celebration and it encourages pastors in other countries also to, to think on those lines. And I've, uh, especially in India, uh, where people have, you know, imbibed that uh, pastoralism is a thing of the past and, and old fashioned and, and so on. When they see this, that, you know, that in, it gets so much attention in Spain and it, it starts, it gets people thinking. So, so they, there's, there's a lot of awareness uh, growing at the moment. I, I'm really optimistic about um, mm. things understanding the value of pastoralism. And even in India now, we have... Uh, um, so in India, the pastoralism was basically invisible. Uh, nobody realized that it actually existed when the whole country is full of pastoralists uh, from the north to the south. And now um, I think there are thoughts among decision makers to do livestock census, not just by number of heads of animals, but uh, the production system in which they are kept. And if we have that, then we, you know, we will see, we will have the data to prove how important pastoralism is. We already, we have some calculations, actually um, estimates, which show that um, more than 50% of the milk and more than 70% of India's meat are produced in passive systems. Right? Mm -hmm. and India is the, the largest uh, um, dairy producer in the world. It's the largest, uh, one of the largest exporters of meat. And um, it's, it, it's enorm, even though everybody always says, oh, we're uh, so backward. Our cows only give four liters of milk and in, in the US they give 40. Uh, so they, they're always complaining, the animal scientists, but actually, if you look at it, it's amazingly productive. Um, yeah. And it has all the, those, it makes so much, yeah, a contribution to the soil fertility. Um, it's just fantastic. <laughs> yeah, you know, I think that there's, um, it's a, I, I remember reading um, a, uh, an Indian historian who was talking about, um, so the green, the green revolution, depending on, on how you study it, um, yeah. there, there, there were trade-offs throughout all of it, um, yes. you know, um, made us heavily dependent upon uh, industrial agriculture in order to maintain it, um, and was not specifically bred that way, it was specifically bred to feed a, a growing population, um, 
But one of the things that it kind of ignores uh, when you study the history of it was that how much, how many of the famines were actually produced by uh, colonial governments. Um, and so when you looked at starvation and you looked at the number of people who were dying, uh, a lot of it was through interventions that were made at, say, the British Empire, which excised millions and millions of pounds of grain mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. and created um, uh, a famine in World War II um, because uh, Churchill's um, Minister of Science um, had decided that he just wanted to hoard all of this. And so I think, I think the estimates now are close to 4 million people died. So when you looked at the need for uh, a fundamental shift in agriculture, what these scientists were looking at, I think was uh, the, the end result of a colonial empire um, and, and agricultural and fiscal policies that, that left a lot of these colonized nations destitute. And then sort of came in and said, hey, we have a fix for you, <laughs> right? And so you had this, <laughs> right? Um, so you had this working system, I think, in India that was, was uh, pastoralist and agriculturalist, working together. Uh, you have all of these different rules that were set in place uh, for, uh, for manure that was left on the land versus on the road. <laughs> there were just yes, all of these different so really much, interesting yeah. stories. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, and just like a, a, a way of community that actually sound, it, it sounds idyllic. It sounds local. It sounds like, um, that, you know, it, overgrazing overgrazing uh was managed because the there was a cooperative system in place um and then you had uh this production at all costs that was coming from the british colonial empire that was pushing all of this stuff towards the agricultural system that we see now which i th just think it's a degraded landscape um sorry that i always have like this like rant i always do it no, 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 I, I agree with every word you said I, I totally, okay totally, yeah mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so, I, I mean, I do think that like a movement back to something that actually feels, you know, like pre-colonial actually makes a lot of sense to me, um, you know? Yes. Yeah. I, I agree. I mean, we don't have, uh, it's not that I'm against modernization or, or, or new things at all, but I mean, we have to, uh, respect and understand how things functioned uh, earlier and then build on that um, and 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 that's been the problem with so much uh, science in in uh, in developing countries or I don't like to use that term at all uh, yeah, the global kind of. south uh, uh, is that people come from the outside and and they have their solutions fat and they don't understand how things are actually functioning. I mean, you you can improve. I mean, if you understand how this, you, first you need to understand how the existing system works and maybe you can, after some time, identify certain things where things might be improved, but, but you can't just come in from the outside without understanding anything and implement something new. Um, mm. Yes. Um. I, I kind of want to leave people with a story uh, that I just found absolutely it's so endearing. Um, can you tell, uh, like, when when you go on an airplane back to Germany, uh, yeah. a lot of the Rika people will, will ask you. <laughs> yes, <laughs> so can you yes, tell yes. that story? Yeah, they always. I mean, they always. I mean, so their question is always, "Oh, how have the rains been there in your country?" Mm -hmm. And and if I say uh, we. Um, uh, we we don't have such a problem with rains. I mean, it rains all year, <laughs> and then and then say, oh, we should bring our sheep there. <laughs> <laughs> no, where where you know? So we've taken many pastoral you know pastors to to many places. I mean, in India and and also outside India, and they always say, look at the vegetation and the and the grass and the trees, and they say, oh, we should have brought our sheep. Uh, even <laughs> if we, we once we went to a university and there was this beautiful lawn and they said, no, my God, we should have grown our sheep. So, yeah, they, they look at everything through the lens of their animals. So. Yeah, which is so amazing. I remember uh, there was a, if I can end with a story, there was a BBC documentary where they were, uh, they were working with uh, uh, hunter gatherers and there was studying um, hunter gatherers. Um, I believe it was in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, and so the, the, the tribe said, uh, they said, well, now you've, we've shown you our land. 
uh, why don't you show us ours? And it was a big sort of argument back and forth, like, what if we showed them all of the technology and all of the modernism that we have <laughs> in London? What will they do? And the anthropologists were like, you have no idea what you're talking about. You know, like, we'll, we'll bring them. So they, so they went to London, uh, they traveled around in London, and then they went to a few farms and they went out to the countryside. Uh, and at the end of it, none of them wanted to stay. <laughs> none really? of them had yeah. any interest in it. <laughs> the only thing that they brought back, the only thing was they had never put feathers on the ends of their arrows. Uh, right. And they thought that that was actually really interesting as a way to guide the arrow. And it was the <laughs> only thing that they cared about. <laughs> and one of the yeah. questions that they, they had brought up, and so they were, they were in somebody's house and they, the, uh, um, uh, the husband was leaving every day to go to work. And they're like, where are you going? Why do you leave every day? Why do you leave your family? Oh. Uh, and, they, and he said, well, I have to work in order to provide this house and food and all this other yeah. stuff. He said, well, how long do you have to work? He said, well, you know, it'll be like 30 years to own this house. And so they're just like, when we need a house, we just gather our friends together and we build a house. It's done. Yeah. <laughs> <You know? laughs> That's right. Yeah. Exactly. And and we believe we there's progress, you know. <laughs> yeah. I'm not sure about that. <laughs> Um, but thank you so much. I, um, I, I want you to, uh, if you feel comfortable, uh, tell yeah. us your, your Twitter handle if people want to reach out to you. Yes. Um, I want to rename the book again. It's called Hoofprints on the Land, uh, How Traditional Herding and Grazing Can Restore the Soil and Bring Animal Agriculture Back in Balance with the Earth. Uh, and um, just thank you so much for writing this. Um, it, for Marin and Jake and I, this was like, you know, we felt heard in the way that we've been screaming about things. And I just really want to appreciate uh, all of the time and effort that you spent on, on putting this book together. Well, thank you so much. I mean, it makes me feel so good that uh, mm. it was worth it. Um, spending 30 years. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody thinks I'm crazy, but I'm, I've had a, a very good time here. Yeah. Um, so. Uh, so Twitter handle, do you want to put that yeah. out? I think it's Ilse Kola, no? Ilse. I L S E and then K O H L E R. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I also have a website called Ilse uh, dash curler dash dash Rollison dot com. And of course, I have to point out the um, website of my organization, the League for Pastoral Peoples, which is just www pastoral peoples dot org. Great. And um, yeah. Great, thank we you. Also have, um, uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, Thanks so much for listening today and for following my work. If you believe in making sure people all over the world should have access to nutritious food, please join my mission through my nonprofit, the Global Food Justice Alliance. Visit sustainabledish.com backslash join and become a sustaining member today. All sustaining members get early access to ad-free podcasts plus free downloads, and you'll be helping get healthy protein like meat, fish, and eggs to food insecure kids. That's sustainabledish.com backslash join, and thank you.